Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this ANU public lecture. I'm Jeanette Lindsay. I'm Deputy Director of the ANU Climate Change Institute and also Deputy Director of the Fenner School of Environment and Society. And as a climate scientist, it's a great pleasure to me to be here with, with you today and to introduce our speaker. But before I do that, we would like to acknowledge the first Australians on whose land we meet and whose cultures are amongst the oldest in our history. And we celebrate their custodianship of the land and the lessons that we can learn from that. I would also like to ask you before we get going to make sure that your mobile phones are switched off or on silent, please. Uh, and also to let you know that once Dr. Hamilton has finished his uh, presentation, he'd be very happy to take questions and we will be running a question and answer session um, after the presentation. Now, I probably first met Clive Hamilton about 10 years ago. We were just uh, trying to establish when it might have been. Uh, he's very well known as a public speaker, as a thinker, as a person who gets us to engage with the difficult issues, the issues with which it's often not very comfortable to engage. And Clive has a long history of speaking and writing uh, and putting out there into the public arena the intellectual debates with which we really do need to engage. Speaking as a climate scientist, um, I would say that there is no more pressing issue that we need to be confronting today than climate change. Um, and I think that the perspective that Clive is going to discuss with us today, uh, the issues around the likelihood, perhaps the inevitability, of us heading down collectively as a human species the road of geoengineering, is something that we really do need to be taking very seriously and thinking very deeply about. And I can't think of a better person to help us to do that and to inspire us to engage with this issue than Clive. Uh, Clive is Professor of Public Ethics at Charles Sturt University and is attached to the Centre for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics here at the ANU. And for many years, as many of you will know, he was Executive Director of the Australia Institute. Clive, without further ado, over to you. Thanks very much, Jeanette, for that uh, introduction. And also would like to thank um, ANU Green for their sponsorship of this event and, of course, ANU uh, Public Affairs uh, for organising it and for you for coming along. Well, in um, August uh, 1883, uh, the painter Edward, Edvard Munch witnessed an unusual blood-red sunset over Oslo. He was shaken by it writing that he, quote, felt a great unending scream piercing through nature. And the incident inspired him to paint his most famous painting, uh, The Scream. And the sunset he saw that evening in 1883 followed the eruption a few days earlier of Krakatoa off the coast of Java. The explosion at Krakatoa, one of the most violent in recorded history, sent a massive plume of ash into the uh, stratosphere turning sunsets red around the globe. The gases emitted uh, uh, also caused the Earth to cool by more than one degree and disrupted weather patterns for several years. Now, the cooling effect of large, volca uh, large volcanic eruptions has been known for some time. Sulfuric acid haze forms from the sulphur dioxide spewed into the upper atmosphere, reducing the amount of solar radiation reaching the Earth. It's estimated, for example, that the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, the largest since Krakatoa, cooled the Earth by around 0.5 degrees centigrade for a year or more. Today, a coalition of forces is quietly constellating around the idea of transforming the Earth's atmosphere by simulating volcanic eruptions to counter the warming effects of carbon pollution. Engineering the planet's climate system is now attracting the attention of scientists, uh, scientific societies, uh, venture capitalists, and conservative think tanks. Despite the enormity of what is being proposed, nothing less than taking control of the Earth's climate system, the public has been almost entirely excluded from the planning. Geoengineering is defined by the Royal Society as the deliberate large-scale manipulation of the planetary environment to counteract anthropogenic climate change. 
methods fall into two types. Carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere and solar radiation management aimed at reducing the amount of heat coming in uh, or reflecting more of it out. A number, taking the first uh, type, uh, a number of methods have been put forward to extract carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, sorry, Mount Pinatubo. Uh, Fertilising uh, the oceans with iron filings is thought to promote the growth of tiny marine plants called phytoplankton that absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as they grow and on death take carbon to the ocean depths. Trials, however, have been unpromising and it's feared that such um, schemes would create dead zones in the ocean. Another idea is to build thousands of devices called sodium trees that would extract carbon dioxide directly from the air and turn it into sodium bicarbonate from which carbon dioxide could be separated before being safely stored somewhere. This too remains speculative and it's hard to see how it would be cheaper to extract carbon dioxide from the air where its concentration is 0.04% than from the exhaust of a coal-fired power plant. Rather than removing surplus carbon from the atmosphere, most geoengineering schemes are aimed at cooling the planet by increasing the Earth's albedo, that is, the extent to which it reflects incoming solar radiation. Some of the ideas would be far-fetched uh, even in a science fiction novel. One proposal is to send 10 trillion 60 centimetre reflective disks in lots of one million every minute for 30 years to a point in space known as L1, which is 1.5 kilometres from the Earth towards the Sun. Another idea is to launch specially designed unmanned ships to plough the oceans, sending plumes of sub-micron drops of seawater into the atmosphere, leaving salty residues uh, that increase cloud cover. Up to uh, 1,500 dedicated vessels uh, would be needed. Others have suggested uh, converting dark coloured forests into light uh, coloured grasslands, or we could mandate the whitening of city roofs and roads, a requirement already uh, for some houses in California, uh, although the creation of these uh, shining cities could offset warming only a little. But the option that's taken most seriously is altogether grander in its conception and scale. This, this, this scheme proposes nothing less than to transform the chemical composition of the Earth's atmosphere so that humans can regulate the temperature of the Earth as desired. It involves injecting sulphur dioxide gas uh, into the stratosphere, 10 to 50 kilometres above the Earth's surface, to create sulphate aerosols, particles that reflect solar radiation. Currently, the atmosphere reflects about 23% of solar radiation back into space and it's estimated that the injection of enough sulphate aerosols to reflect an additional 2% uh, would offset the warming associated with the doubling of the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Various schemes have been proposed with the most promising being adaptation of high-flying aircraft fitted with extra tanks and nozzles to spray the chemicals a fleet of 747s could do the job. To have the desired effect, we'd need the equivalent of one Mount Pinatubo eruption every three or four years. The emissions of the eruption in April of Iceland's Mount Unpronounceable <laughs> were less than a hundredth of those from Pinatubo. So we'd need the equivalent of one of these every week, indefinitely. Another analogy is the vast brown haze due largely to the burning of fossil fuels which envelops the lower stratosphere and is concentrated over South Asia and China. By cutting the amount of incoming solar radiation, the haze keeps the Earth cooler than it would otherwise be, a process of global dimming that masks the effects of global warming. In fact, uh, when all aircraft were grounded after the 9-11 uh, attacks, uh, within a couple of days, because of the uh, reduced amount of dimming, uh, temperatures in the United States increased. Attempting to regulate the Earth's 
climate by enhanced dimming is fraught with dangers and would probably backfire. Uh, for example, uh, the oceans absorb around a third of the extra carbon dioxide pumped into the atmosphere by humans. The acidity of the oceans is slowly rising, dissolving corals and inhibiting shell formation by marine organisms. Injecting sulphur dioxide into the stratosphere may reduce incoming solar radiation, but it would do nothing to slow the acidification of the oceans. In other words, responding to warming by reducing the amount of solar radiation reaching the Earth's surface disregards the complexity of the climate system. And, of course, it's not just about the atmosphere, but the entire carbon cycle that governs life on Earth. In 1954, uh, the eminent uh, geoscientist Harrison Brown published a book in which he proposed solving the world hunger by increasing the carbon dioxide content of the Earth's uh, atmosphere to stimulate plant growth. Brown suggested the construction of, quote, huge carbon dioxide generators pouring gas into the atmosphere and calculated that doubling the amount in the atmosphere uh, would require the burning of at least 500 billion tonnes of coal. Brown's book was endorsed by Albert Einstein. Well, his wish has come true. We have huge carbon dioxide generators pouring gas into the atmosphere. They're called coal-fired power plants. Curiously, it was one of Brown's students, Charles David Keeling, who a decade later from his measuring station on Mauna Loa in Hawaii, first alerted the world to the rising concentration of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and its implications for uh, warming of the Earth. Well, although um, ideas for climate engineering have been around for at least 20 years, until recently, public discussion has been discouraged by the scientific community. Environmentalists and governments, too, have been reluctant to talk about it. And the reason is simple. Apart from its unknown side effects, geoengineering would weaken resolve to cut carbon emissions. Economically, it's an extremely attractive substitute uh, because the costs of geoengineering are estimated to be trivial uh, compared to those of cutting carbon pollution. Cheap enough for a single country to offset the entire emissions of the world. To date, governments have feared being accused of wanting to escape their responsibilities by pursuing science fiction solutions. The topic is not mentioned at all in the Stern report and receives only one page in the Garno report. As a sign of uh, continuing uh, political sensitivity, when in April 2009 it was reported that President Obama's new science advisor, John Holdren, had said that geoengineering is being vigorously discussed as an emergency option in the White House, he immediately felt the need to issue a clarification, claiming that he was expressing only his personal views. Now, Holdren is uh, one of the sharpest minds uh, in the business and would not be entertaining Plan B engineering the planet to head off catastrophic warming, unless he was fairly sure that Plan A would fail. Nevertheless, so anxious are scientists at the escalation of emissions and the tardiness of the response that some now feel emergency measures must be considered. The dam broke with a 2006 editorial by the eminent German uh, atmospheric chemist Paul Crutzen. Crutzen, who won the 1995 Nobel Prize for Chemistry for his work on discovering the hole in the ozone layer, wrote that cutting emissions is by far the preferred way to respond to warming. But in the absence of resolute action, it's time now to explore, quote, the usefulness of artificially enhancing Earth's albedo and thereby cooling climate by adding sunlight reflecting aerosols to the stratosphere. On the surface, fiddling with the dimmer switch is an almost irresistible political fix for governments. It gets powerful lobbies off their backs, gives the green light to burn more coal, avoids the need to raise petrol taxes, 
allows unrestrained economic growth and, of course, uh, is no threat to consumer lifestyles. In short, compared with cutting greenhouse gas emissions, geoengineering gets everyone off the hook. No government is yet willing to lend official support to geoengineering, but the pressure is building. And the day when the government of a major nation publicly backs serious consideration of Plan B can't be far off. Then the floodgates will open. Even now, uh, under the radar, Russia has already begun testing. Yuri Israel, a Russian scientist who's advised uh, Prime Minister Putin, has tested the effects of aerosol spraying uh, from a helicopter on uh, solar radiation reaching the ground, and he now plans a full-scale trial. Not all advocates of climate engineering adopt a cautious approach. Some are gung-ho about it. When the potentially severe side effects of geoengineering are pointed out, the more cavalier climate engineers say they can be managed with other techniques, such as spreading lime in the oceans to counter acidification. Some concede that liming the oceans would not be feasible as a generalised response. They're pretty big, after all. <laughs> but they maintain it could still be deployed to protect highly valued zones. One idea is to offset acidification by installing a network of undersea pipes that inject alkalis around sites such as the Great Barrier Reef. For some, turning the planet into a museum of natural artefacts while the rest goes to ruin seems easier than phasing out coal. In classical Athens, hubris was a crime. In a memorable instance, after Achilles had killed Hector, he tied the body to his chariot and dragged it around. In modern times, parallels can be seen in the willingness of US soldiers at Iraq's Abu Ghraib prison to take photographs of their captives in humiliating poses. Now, in ancient Greece, hubris was paired with Nemesis, the goddess of divine retribution, whose blade of vengeance, wrote Aeschylus, yields a ripe harvest of repentant woe on those who imagine themselves to be beyond the reach of the gods or put themselves above the laws of man. The climate engineers believe they can control the forces of nature and bend Gaia's will to their own. For millions of years, the temperature of the Earth and the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have more or less moved together, creating both ice ages and warm epochs. The relationship is governed by certain primary factors, notably peaks of solar radiation, volcanic events, methane release, and now human release of fossil fuels, um, as well as secondary feedbacks, especially ice melt changing the Earth's albedo and carbon dioxide release from land and oceans. Recourse to climate engineering to counter human-induced warming is an unconscious attempt by one species to decouple the great process that links the composition of the Earth's atmosphere to the temperature of the Earth and the biotic systems uh, of the land and oceans. Instead of decoupling growth of the economy from growth of carbon emissions, a link only couple of centuries old, the climate engineers want to decouple global warming from growth of carbon emissions, a link as old as life itself. More vivid sunsets like the one Edvard Munch saw would be one of the consequences of using sulphate aerosols to engineer the climate. But a more disturbing effect of enhanced dimming would be the permanent whitening of daytime skies. A washed out sky would become the norm. If the nations of the world resort to climate engineering and in doing so relieve pressure to cut carbon emissions, then the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would continue to rise and so would the latent warming suppressed uh, um, by uh, geoengineering solutions. It would then become impossible to stop 
sulphur injections into the stratosphere, even for a year or two, without an immediate jump in temperature. And it's estimated that uh, if we did stop, the backup of greenhouse gases could see warming rebound at a rate 10 to 20 times faster than in the recent past, a phenomenon referred to, apparently without irony, as the termination problem. <laughs> Once we start manipulating the atmosphere, we could be trapped, forever dependent on a program of sulphur injections into the stratosphere. In that case, human beings would never see a blue sky again. And perhaps anticipating this, although without knowledge of it, Lunig, a few years ago, drew this cartoon. Blue sky, artificial, sorry, blue day, artificial sky. Now, the international community has found it difficult to agree on strong collective measures to reduce emissions. Country circumstances are diverse and impacts uncertain. Against this, climate engineering is cheap, uh, immediately effective and, more importantly, available to uh, a single nation. Among the feasible uh, contenders for unilateral intervention, uh, one uh, expert um, names China, the US, the European Union, Russia, India, Japan and Australia. The situation might be compared to one in which seven people live together in a centrally heated house, each with their own thermostat and each with a different ideal temperature. China will be severely affected by warming, but Russia might prefer the globe to be a couple of degrees warmer. If there's no international agreement, an impatient nation suffering the effects of climate disruption may decide to act alone. It's not out of the question that in three or so decades' time, the climate of the Earth could be determined by a handful of Communist Party officials in Beijing, or the government of Australia, an Australia crippled by permanent drought, collapsing agriculture and ferocious bushfires could risk the wrath of the world by embarking on a climate control project. If this seems far-fetched, Perhaps the most sobering question to ask of the future of geoengineering is, what would Sarah Palin do? <laughs> Two of the earliest and most aggressive advocates of planetary engineering were Edward Teller and Lowell Wood. Teller was the co-founder and director of the Lawrence Livermore, Livermore National Laboratory near San Francisco said to have a, quote, near mythological status as the dark heart of weapons research. He is often described as the father of the hydrogen bomb. Here he is, patting one. And was the inspiration for Dr Strangelove, the wheelchair-bound mad scientist prone to Nazi salutes in Stanley Kubrick's 1964 film of that name. In 1979, Teller blamed Jane Fonda for his heart attack, taking out a full-page advertisement in the New York Times, claiming the heart attack was brought on by his frenetic efforts to counter anti-nuclear propaganda after the Three Mile Island accident. Lowell Wood was recruited by Teller to the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and became his protege. For decades, Wood was one of the Pentagon's foremost weaponeers, leading him to be christened Dr Evil by his critics, a sobriquet in which he revels, apparently. He led the group tasked with developing the technology for Ronald Reagan's uh, ill-fated Star Wars missile shield, which included plans for an array of orbiting X-ray lasers powered by nuclear reactors. Since 1998, Wood and Teller have been promoting aerosol spraying into the stratosphere as a simple and cheap counter to global warming. Like uh, fellow members of the scientific elite that provided the brain power for the military industrial complex in the post-war decades, Teller and Wood believe it's man's duty to exert supremacy over nature. 
It's perhaps for this reason that they have long associations with conservative think tanks that deny the existence of human-induced global warming. For example, Wood is listed as an expert with the George C. Marshall Institute, a Washington think tank beca that became uh, one of the main centres of climate denial in the 1990s. Wood is also a visiting fellow at the uh, right-wing Hoover Institution, a centre of climate scepticism partly funded by ExxonMobil. It's strange that geoengineering is being promoted enthusiastically by a number of right-wing think tanks that are active in climate denialism. For example, the American Enterprise Institute, um, an influential conservative think tank that offered $10,000 to <coughs> academics to write papers debunking the IPCC, that <coughs> institute has launched a high-profile project to promote geoengineering. Why would activists who deny warming is occurring and oppose measures to reduce emissions support the development of a technology aimed at countering global warming? Of course, geoengineering protects their supporters and financiers in the fossil fuel industries because it can be a substitute for abatement and a justification for delay. But I think a deeper explanation lies in their beliefs about the relationship of humans to the natural world. Pursuing abatement is an admission that industrial society has harmed nature. While engineering the Earth's climate would be a confirmation of our mastery over it. Final proof that whatever minor errors were made along the way, human ingenuity in fa and faith in our abilities will always triumph. Geoengineering promises to turn uh, failure into victory. While some agonise over whether geoengineering would be a substitute for greenhouse gas reductions, instead of a complement to them, Wood and Teller and the right-wing think tanks that promote climate manipulation have few doubts. Not, uh, not only should it be pursued instead of reducing emissions, but, some argue, geoengineering plus rising carbon dioxide concentrations would in fact be a superior outcome compared to a situation in which there is no global warming to worry about. Why? Because air fertilisation would stimulate food production while we manage to keep warming under control. Lowell Wood believes that engineering is inevitable. It's a matter of time before what he calls the political elites, elites wake up to its cheapness and effectiveness. In a statement that uh, could serve as the Earth's epitaph, Wood declared, we've engineered every other environment we live in, why not the planet? Lowell Wood is contemptuous of the ability of world leaders to reduce emissions, which he dubs the bureaucratic suppression of CO2, uh, and of their ability to reach a consensus on trialling geoengineering. Uh, in Jeff Goodell's words, he's a commentator, a uh, journalist who writes about this, uh, Wood predicts popular resistance to the idea of in uh, Goodell's words, toying with the integrity of the Earth's climate just so Americans don't have to give up their SUVs. And so Wood speculates about getting private funding from a billionaire for an experiment. Uh, Wood said, as far as I can determine, there's no law that prohibits doing something like this. And in fact, Wood is right. There is no law against a private individual attempting to tinker with the Earth's climate. And I think this goes to the heart of the push to develop the tools for climatic manipulation. The debate over engineering uh, the world's climate is at present largely confined to a tight-knit group of scientists uh, and venture capitalists, uh, some of whom want to keep the public in the dark uh, so that they can fend off regulation of their activities. Not all of them, but some of them. And in his book, How to Cool the Planet, Jeff Goodell reveals a series of three private dinners held on the fringes of the 2009 conference of the American Geophysical Union that brought together the main players, 
The dinners were convened by two leaders in the field, Ken Caldera of Stanford University and David Keith of the University of Calgary, and Lowell Wood was a prominent presence. And Goodell describes the three dinners as, quote, a turning point in the evolution of geoengineering as a policy tool. And he quoted Wood's summing up of the dinners. This is like nothing that human beings have thought about before. Wood subsequently emailed uh, Goodell saying that when he talks to people opposed to geoengineering, he just says to them, you don't have to argue with me and I don't have to argue with you. Let's find something more pleasant to talk about because I'm going to win. Why bother informing the public when engineering the climate is inevitable? We just need to wait until the fools realise that there's no alternative. In March this year, a private meeting of leading climate engineers and venture capitalists, scientists and venture capitalists, uh, held in Asilomar in California, uh, was held to um, develop guidelines to govern research and testing of climate engineering. Those invited wanted a voluntary code of conduct that would forestall regulation by government and, inter and the international community so that the experts could work unhindered in their task of understanding how to control the Earth's climate. And in a bizarre uh, aside, it emerged later that the principal sponsor of this meeting in Asilomar was none other than the government of Victoria in Australia. David Keith has argued that an international treaty may be unnecessary because the use of solar radiation management could be regulated by unwritten norms. This is despite his acknowledgement that the threat of unilateral action is very real. Any one of a dozen countries could begin it within a few years. Keith, in fact, says one person could decide to do it. He wrote, the fact is that with the right technology, it may be cheap enough through engineering the stratosphere that literally individual human beings may have the wealth necessary to introduce an ice age. Perhaps the wealthy individual he has in mind is Bill Gates, who's uh, covertly been funding geoengineering research for three or more years with the advice of Keith and Caldera. Uh, they now oversee Gates's research fund, which has spent some $4.5 million to, to date, including funding the three dinners uh, at Asilomar. Uh, David Keith won't reveal what the money is being spent on, uh, downplaying it as, quote, a little private funding agency. Right. The world's richest man has a little private funding agency devoted to researching ways to manipulate the Earth's climate system. Conspiracy theory, anyone? Gates is also an investor in a firm named Intellectual Ventures that's promoting a scheme called StratoShield, which would pump sulphur dioxide into the upper atmosphere through a 30 kilometer hose held aloft by V-shaped blimps. Intellectual Ventures is run by a man called Nathan Mervold, former chief technology officer at Microsoft, and includes Lowell Wood among its associates. Gates is not the only billionaire Lone Ranger who wants to save the planet. Richard Branson has set up his own war room to do battle with, climate war with global warming. The battalions he wants to mobilise on the, quote, the path to victory are successful entrepreneurs like himself and their weapons are, quote, market-driven solutions to climate change. It's the shiny new business model to save the planet. The Carbon War Room, where inspirational quotes from Richard Branson are mixed in with those from other titans like Churchill, Roosevelt and Einstein, represents the type of rich man's folly common amongst modern entrepreneurs with a messiah complex. Branson's War Room um, links to a paper co-authored by Lee Lane 
of the American Enterprise Institute, published by the center run by skeptical environmentalist Bjorn Lomborg. The paper concludes that the benefits of geoengineering vastly outweigh the costs and shows how to set an optimal temperature for the Earth for the next 200 years. The authors write that ethical objections from environmental advocacy groups may present an obstacle to the deployment of solar radiation management, before noting with relief, quote, in reality, important economies remain largely beyond the influence of environmental advocacy groups. They expect that deployment of solar radiation management will be led by nations with weak environmental lobbies, which of course means dictatorships. The climate engineers, to finish off then, want to uh, respond to climate peril with a grand intervention, a technological conquest of technology designed to seize control of the planet's climate system. It's an approach breathtaking in its audacity and astonishing in its arrogance. The attitude of the planetary engineers is so out of sync with contemporary climate science and so at odds with modern attitudes to the natural world that they appear as throwbacks from another era. Perhaps the one captured by Arthur Conan Doyle in his fictional character, Professor George Edward Challenger, a crazed and pugnacious scientist blessed with a supreme faith in his own intellectual capabilities. In a short story, first published in 1928, Professor Challenger is struck by a Lovelockian insight that, quote, the world upon which we live is itself a living organism endowed with a circulation, a respiration and a nervous system of its own. Deducing that this sentient earth must be oblivious to the presence of Lilliputian creatures crawling over its outer rind, the professor resolves to, quote, let the earth know that there is at least one person, George Edward Challenger, who calls for attention, who indeed is, insists upon intention, attention. So, in the Sussex countryside, he orders a shaft dug through the crust eight miles deep. When the pit reaches the soft, heaving body of the giant organism, he orders a sharp, 100-foot drill to be suspended just above it. When all is ready, including the assembly up above, of a bevy of dignitaries and a throng of curious members of the public, the iron dart is, quote, shot into the nerve ganglion of old Mother Earth. And the effect, quote, it was a howl in which pain, anger, menace, and the outraged majesty of nature all blended into one hideous shriek. The earth trembled and the great pit closed over like a wound being healed. As the tumult settled and the multitude gathered its wits, all eyes turned to Challenger as the mighty achievement, the huge sweep of the conception, the genius and wonder of the execution broke upon their minds. The triumphant professor bowed to their acclaim. Quote, Challenger, the super, super scientist. Challenger, the arch pioneer. Challenger, the first man whom Mother Earth had been compelled to recognise. The same desire to dominate and control the Earth that drove Edward Challenger persists in the grand designs of today's geoengineers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clive. You've given us uh, a great deal to think about. Um, I was very aware of the responses of the audience while you were talking, and I certainly heard a number of people uh, 
reacting to some of the information that you gave us. Um, I think it, to use a quote um, from Lord May commenting on Clive's latest book, Requiem for a Species, uh, he says there that Hamilton's book presents a powerful statement of the problems confronting us, not just the problem of climate change itself, but the tendency to wish the problem away by denial. I think we could apply that to a consideration of what Clive has just told us. Do we wish the problem of the approaches that are being taken to tinkering with the climate system and attempting to dominate it away by denial, or do we engage with those problems? I would invite you to engage with Clive and to address your questions to him. Uh, yeah, indeed. Um, well, look, I don't claim a huge amount of expertise. I've read as, as much of the literature as I can, including the scientific ex expertise. The injection of sulphate uh, particles into the stratosphere, uh, they apparently stay there up there for a year or two, whereas they only stay there for a few days if it's in the lower atmosphere, so that smog over you know, South Asia, for example, has to uh, be added to constantly because if it stopped within a week or two, it would clear. Um, but nevertheless, the sulphate particles do fall to earth and uh, it would uh, contribute to acid rain, although I understand, don't hold me to this, that the, uh, that the uh, concentration of acidity in the rain that would result is not uh, nearly as high as the classic acid rain phenomenon that was uh, common uh, you know, two, three decades ago over Europe, for example. On plant growth, yes, the reduction in incoming solar radiation would, other things being equal, of course they're not equal, uh, reduce the amount of um, uh, sunlight uh, being absorbed by plants and in some areas for some crops would uh, reduce the rate of growth of those plants. But of course there are lots of other effects. I mean one of the main concerns I didn't mention was the possibility uh, of, uh, generated through uh, one of the climate models uh, to be uh, confirmed by future modelling the possibility that uh, 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 geoengineering in this way could disrupt the, uh, the Indian monsoon, uh, leading to widespread crop failures. Uh, a couple of comments. Um, you focus on some of the kind of ecomaniacs or perhaps crazies involved in thinking about geoengineering. It's true and it's entertaining, but I think it also needs to be realised that there is actually some serious and nuanced scientific thinking about these issues, as evidenced in many journal articles, a session at the last year's Copenhagen Climate Congress, um, and for instance, the UK Royal Society that uh, published a major report on, on the issue last year. Second point I wanted to make is um, I think in talking about Holton, you said uh, surely he wouldn't be uh, entertaining. Plan B, geoengineering. Uh, if, the, if he wasn't convinced, or if he, if he wasn't thinking that there's serious risk of Plan A failing. Now, if we think of climate change a risk management uh, issue, which I think is a very useful framework to use, um, then uh, actually we should be entertaining Plan B, even if uh, we are hoping or if we are uh, reasonably confident that Plan A will work out anyway. So. Uh, we want to know just, just in case, you know, what space will we be in if Plan A fails and what are the options then?
Look, I think that's a, a perfectly uh, legitimate argument, and then there, are, there are some careful, thoughtful scientists who have decided that the situation is so dire that we do need to investigate Plan B because we may be compelled to use it. And uh, I think that's a, a, a legitimate argument, um, but I think there are serious, as I, the thrust of my talk indicates, there are serious risks, and that is that um, um, if you project yourself forward 20 or 30 years, when uh, we suddenly wake up, I mean, many of us have already woken up, of course, but the world more generally wakes up to it and decides to go down the climate engineering path, who actually is going to take over and control it then? It's not going to be the cautious, careful scientists who are saying, look, we must abate first and only regard this as a backup plan. It's going to be more likely to be uh, the venture capitalists, the uh, conservative governments looking for a quick fix. So that's what uh, frightens me about uh, geoengineering. I mean, look, I mean, someone, a couple of people have said to me, look, you've just written a book saying that it's too late, we can't stop catastrophic climate change, so really the logical conclusion is for you is to just say, well, we have to use plan B. But um, I don't advocate that, and the reason for that is that I don't think we have the capacity to make proper decisions about plan B. Um, I think we have to first reflect as, uh, as a community, a global community, I think we have to reflect very carefully on how we got to this point, um, why we've allowed ourselves to get into this uh, intractable crisis. And I think the thinking that got us into this mess will not get us out of it. In fact, if we use the same thinking that got us into this mess, that is that technology will solve it, let's embark on large engineering type problems, let's, let's look for the cheapest option, let's take the view that whatever happens we can intervene and control the impacts just as we always have. Uh, I, think that, I think we're drunk on 300 years of, um, of technological conquest. And to argue that um, the answer is more of uh, that thinking and that sort of intervention on even grander terms, uh, I think is really inviting disaster. Uh, I think that uh, if we, even in 20, 30 years' time, when we've investigated and understand it much better, uh, one thing we've learnt in all the climate science that's, been done, science that's been done over the last 20 or 30 years is just how complicated and difficult to understand and control the climate system of the, of the Earth is. And so to attempt to uh, juggle it so that, you know, we can deal with the consequences of carbon emissions by... Uh, changing the chemical uh, composition of the atmosphere. I mean, you, when you pose it that way, I mean, it almost answers itself, doesn't it? I mean, it's madness. It's a form of madness that we can't understand just how dangerous it is uh, to go down that path. I think, so this is why I say we need a, com to, a, a transformed consciousness uh, where we understand that we can't control nature and that if we attempt to, uh, then we, you know, nemesis will kick in. Uh, so that's why, I mean, I think that's how we have to frame this whole thing rather than saying we've got this problem that's caused by technological overreach, no worries, we'll just come up with another grand technology to solve it. Andrew? Well, um, I really wish to thank you, Clark, for an inspiring and scary talk. Uh, I think it's important to point out that there are two types of plan B. One, the one you talked about, with injection of sulfur into the atmosphere, and there are also the mirrors in space, with less damaging, it's still possible. But the second one is actually one which was promoted by the organization 350, 350 parts per million. It was partly costed, uh, it's mentioned by James Hansen in some of his papers, and uh, it's a truly sodium trees, but a number of other devices, which is by the charm. Uh, in the planting of forests. This second objective, that some people say it should be 350, should be 320, uh, this, this might be the answer, even though the technology of starting trees is not still being tested. Yeah. However, the costing means that uh, funds in the scale of the world's uh, arms space or armament expenditure, the world's wars, will have to be diverted yeah. into Plan B. Uh, Roughly, rough costing, which I've gleaned from James Hansen, is 20 trillion. This is what the US has used for the past 20 years for military purposes. Which means, in putting it in other terms, 
the world does have a choice between trying to mitigate carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's not certain it can be done, but it could possibly already in other ways. Yeah. Or either try to do that, whatever the chances are, or whether it's continuous, the more effort and yeah. continuous yeah. the way you're discarding. Yeah. Sure, look. Some forms of geoengineering, and in a way the, the term is unfortunate because it covers su such a diversity of technologies. I've focused pretty much all my attention today on sulphate aerosols in the stratosphere because that's the one that's attracting most attention. It seems to be most likely uh, to be adopted at some point in the future and the most dangerous one. But there are others which are you know, much more benign. And Andrew, you've mentioned that ones like obviously biochar and reforestation, possibly sodium trees but it's very uh, under, underdeveloped. And these, of course, are much less risky uh, because they are designed to suck carbon out of the atmosphere to, uh, to, to counter the effects of uh, we humans pumping uh, carbon into the atmosphere. Of course, not pumping it into the atmosphere is always uh, the best and the cheapest uh, solution. But there's no doubt, given where we are now, um, with the increased concentrations and the need to get back down well below where we are now, we're going to have to take uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere somehow if we are uh, to offset or avoid some of the worst effects of climate change. So certainly that uh, deserves research and should be done. However, we should bear in mind that it doesn't solve the moral hazard problem. That is, if uh, someone does come up with a reasonably effective uh, and reasonably uh, uh, cheap way of taking carbon out of the atmosphere, it will unquestionably uh, reduce pressure on governments to cut uh, carbon pollution. And so we could easily get up, get into a situation where carbon pollution continues on its uh, upward path and uh, somewhere else we have another industry, it will need to be a vast industry designed to take that carbon back out of the atmosphere and store it somewhere for thousands of years. Any further questions? Hey, thanks a lot for the talk today. I have a couple of questions. One was uh, how do we know if this is already being used by governments around the world to manipulate the climate change? And secondly, uh, you said it's a cheap solution uh, when, when it's cheap uh, compared to other solutions to climate change. How does it compare? And uh, uh, if it were cheap, was it cheap for governments or would it be led by a market? Uh, yeah, two, two very good questions. <clears throat> How do we know it's not already being used? Um, well, I don't think it is, uh, although there's a bit of conspiratorial talk on the web occasionally, uh, often by people who are into this contrails conspiracy. Uh, look, I, I think we'd know about it. You know, I mean, it's very hard to keep something like that secret uh, over, over any period, really. Uh, so, uh, and I don't think any government, even one in Russia or China, would risk uh, the sort of backlash if they did start engaging in it. It's not to say that they won't in the future, but I don't think uh, it's. Ha I think when it does happen, we'll know about it fairly soon. So, so how cheap? Well, uh, extremely cheap, uh, can certainly compared to carbon abatement. I mean, it wouldn't take much to modify a fleet of 747s, uh, stick the sulphur, sulfuric acid in modified tanks, and send them up there and start spraying it out. Um, and certainly cheap enough, as people have said, for one billionaire uh, with a messiah complex to, to get out there and do it. Um, and who would do it? Um, I think that it would be done uh, at the behest of a government, but they would probably contract out the process to private corporations. And there's certainly a lot of people uh, who, are uh, with uh, money, who have taken a keen interest in a range of geoengineering uh, techniques, uh, anticipating that there'll be big money uh, to be made in it. And uh, I know there's some iron fertilisation research going on at the ANU, which I'm sure is very, and indeed at CSIRO down in Hobart, and it's being done in the right professional research circumstances. But there are also uh, entrepreneurial cowboys out there are doing it uh, off their own bat, wanting to generate emission credits from it with a view to flogging them off. I mean, you know, it's, it's just completely beyond the pale when done under those circumstances for all sorts of reasons you can imagine. Question in the centre and then, yeah. Gentleman in the centre. Yes. 
Thank you for your talk, Clive. Um, mine's a, more of a comment, actually, but uh, I just wanted to pick up that thread about the, uh, the sort of engineering uh, approach and, and paradigm that sort of predominated our interaction with, with the natural world. And uh, one of the, the things that's contributed to that, I guess, is a lack of appreciation of the complexity of natural systems. And one of the reasons you perhaps couldn't rattle off a list of undesirable consequences is we often can't envision them because you know, we haven't done something like this before. But we have good past examples such as the, the myriad of problems that have occurred in the Murray Durham Basin as a result of um, engineering and, and tinkering with the water flows there and various issues with uh, where we've interfered with natural ecosystems and, and thrown things out of what was quite a complex balance that had, that had been stable for quite a long period. If you might yeah, indeed, and, and I think, and this is my, in a sense, the sort of thrust of my whole argument, that it's the, the instrumentalist attitude which we modern humans have towards the natural world, that is treating it as a sort of catalogue of resources which we can manipulate for our own material benefit, which is fundamental to Western civilization. This is really, this is what lies, this is what lies at the very heart of the problem. And uh, it's not nowadays expressed in such crude terms as Arthur Conan Doyle did through the vehicle of uh, Professor Challenger, but I think exactly that same attitude uh, still prevails. And in fact, you can find people like Lowell Wood who express it just as crudely. And these are people uh, uh, with very uh, considerable influence. So I, you know, my, I think our only hope is that the climate crisis brings about a crisis of consciousness and that we can transcend this uh, instrumentalist understanding of the world which so uh, dominates uh, modern consciousness. It is, after all, the um, uh, unspoken foundation uh, on page one of every economics book. You open it up, page one, right there between the lines, is an instrumentalist, anthropocentric understanding of the world. You, you put that to an economist and they say, what are you talking about? That's just how the world is. That's just human nature without any understanding that, no, this is a particular philosophical um, uh, point of view that is actually quite modern and very Western. And uh, as long as we don't transcend that, then we will have recourse to these grand and crazed schemes to take control of the, whole, of the Earth's climate totally. Just to sort of illustrate this to you, um, that paper I referred to uh, from Lee Lane and the American Enterprise Institute, they used the DICE model uh, to make projections and work out the optimal temperature for the Earth. So here you've got these people for 200 years. So here you've got these people using an economic model to look at the cost of geoengineering and the cost of abatement and then saying, well, what's going to be the impact on plants and so on of increased uh, concentrations of carbon dioxide? We'll feed it all into a model. We'll make a projection of the optimal temperature for the Earth for the next 200 years, and they are saying this is what we should do. I mean, I think this is madness. This is, this is so utterly... <laughs> it, it leaves me breathless that there are human beings with influence who think this way. I mean, they're quite serious. They're saying this is what we should do because this will optimise human welfare over the next 200 years. Here we go, an optimal increase in temperature of 3 degrees uh, by... Um, uh, sorry, the dice optimal. No, it's uh, 3.4 degrees by 20, uh, 2,205. This will maximise human welfare if we go along this trajectory. And these people are serious. Sorry, just aside from the um, human and economic and what have you consequences of introducing aerosols to the stratosphere, do you think that would be the death of ground-based astronomy? Well, certainly, um, uh, that's a concern that's been raised in the literature uh, that, uh, you know, the telescopes have got a lot more crap to get through before they can see what's, what's beyond the Earth. So, yes, uh, that in uh, induced global dimming is something that some astronomers have expressed concerns about. Like one thousand years. Yeah. If you 
take this relationship for, let's say, a couple of hundred thousand years, you will probably see that the temperature rises first, and then carbon dioxide rises. And, <clears throat> and there is a pretty stable uh, relationship. And there was no human intervention back then. Mm. And I've seen this graph to be in various uh, climate change denial um, mm. websites as well. So if that is true, I mean, I'm not sure, I'm not an expert in this mm. field, but I'm not sure which one is true. Well, I'm, I, I'm enough of an expert, uh, having spoken to experts, to know that this is a very crude claim by the climate denialists, because no one is saying that the only impact uh, on global temperatures is uh, human-induced carbon emissions. That you know, I actually listed them in my talk, that there are a range of other primary forcings, like uh, volcanic uh, eruptions, uh, like, uh, and Andrew Glickson here is an expert on this, um, asteroid uh, impacts, and a range of others, which can um, uh, turn the relationship around so that temperature, uh, temperature rises um, uh, induce increases in carbon dioxide concentrations uh, because, you know, they melt permafrost and so on and give rise to, uh, to increased uh, uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, but we're not suffering uh, the effects of one of those at the moment. What we're seeing is the effect of an increase in concentrations of carbon dioxide caused by humans, which is being followed uh, by uh, a temperature increase. So no one's saying that in the paleoclimate history, the relationship always has to be one way. It goes both ways. At the moment, we're in a situation where uh, the primary forcing factor is uh, carbon emissions through human activity, which is driving up temperature.